Hello, everyone. My name is Lu Fang. I'm a PhD student from University of California, Irvine. Today, I will give a talk about our work, Interruptible Task. This is a joint work with my colleague, Ken Yang, my advisor, Guo Ting Xu, uh, Brian Dembski, and Shen Lu. Now, we are in the big data era to process huge amount of data. Developers have developed many um, different uh, data parallel systems, such as Hadoop, Spark, Hive, Mahout, and many other systems. In those systems, input data are divided into independent partitions and can be processed simultaneously by different tasks. With the help of those systems, processing big data becomes much easier. But when you use these, these systems, memory pressure, many users complain about the memory pressure problem on single machines. So to understand this problem, we had a thorough study. By searching two keywords, out of memory and data parallel in Stack Overflow, we have collected 126 related problems. So here we give the definition of memory pressure. It's a scenario that the data, uh, data parallel program pushes the heap limit and <coughs> the system struggles for memory to allocate new objects. From this figure, we can see quite a few long and useless GC. Um, a typical data parallel system, um, they are implemented usually in managed language such as Java. So they use garbage collection to re reclaim memory. Long means it takes a while to finish the garbage collection. Useless means um, the garbage collection cannot reclaim much memory. Usually, um, the program, if it suffers from memory pressure, it will crash because of out of memory error. Um, even it can successful, successfully run to the end. Um, the, program, uh, the performance is badly hurt because we sp spend too much time on capture collection. Based on our study, we have summarized two major root causes. One is hot keys. In a typical data parallel system, input data are represented as key value pairs. Some keys are very popular, so they have a lot of associated values. When we process this, kind of, this kind of popular keys, then the system may suffer from memory pressure. Here is an interesting example. This example is collected from Stack Overflow. Developers try to process all st Stack Overflow posts. Some posts are quite long and are very popular. They have a lot of comments. Uh, when they try to process this kind of uh, long and popular post, it will consume a lot of memory, almost the whole heap. And suddenly, the system suffers from memory pressure, and the program crash because out of memory error. The secondary rules for memory pressure problem is large intermediate results generated by the task. During the execution, the task may create some temporary data structures. If the data structures are too large, they can incur the memory pressure. Here is another interesting case from Stack Overflow. Some developers try to use a, a third party library to process some customer's review. Some reviews are quite long, and the third-party library create a giant temporary data structure for it. And suddenly, the, uh, the system suffers from memory pressure and crash. So we want to solve the memory pressure problem, and uh, people already proposed some solutions. Can we, so uh, can we solve the memory pr pressure problem by adding more memory? Um, not really, although it can alleviate the memory pressure problem. But as we know, um, the data increase much faster than the memory. At application level, there are two common suggestions are recommended on the website, such as Stack Overflow. One suggestion is to tune the configuration to reduce memory pressure. This is very time consuming because we have so many parameters in the modern data parallel system. For example, the Hadoop has about 200 parameters. Some 
memory pressure problem can also be solved by fixing the skews in the input data. But this is also very time consuming, um, and there's no tool. It's general enough to handle all kinds of skews for all kinds of input side, data set. At the application level, people have developed cluster-wide resource manager, such as YARM. Um, so use this kind of uh, resource manager, we can efficiently use the resource in the cluster. But those resource manager cannot solve the entirety of the problem, although it can alleviate um, when we reproduce the um, memory pressure problems reported on Stack Overflow, we enable the YARN, but we still see the program suffer from memory pressure and crash. So we need a systematic and effective solutions for memory pressure problem. Here is our solution, interruptible task. For short, we call it iTask. The main idea is to treat the memory pressure as interrupt. So we can terminate data parallel task upon the memory pressure, and we can release the memory occupied by these interrupted tasks. So we have more memory for the remaining task to continue the execution and finish. Using our technique, uh, the system can dynamic, dynamically change parallelism degree. So we can help the program survive memory pressure. I will go through this example to explain why our technique helped the program survive memory pressure. In this slide, at the top, it shows the memory consumption trees of a data parallel program. And at the bottom, um, it shows the tasks and consume the memory. The program starts with multiple tasks. And after a while, uh, the program pushes the limit and start struggling for the, uh, more memory to allocate new objects. We can see quite a few long and use usually sculpture correction here. And at the end, the program will crash because of out of memory error. What, uh, with the help of a technique, when we detect the memory pressure, so that means we see quite a few long and usually sculpture correction, then we will start terminating the tasks. And then the task is in, in, in terminated, so we can have more memory for the remaining task. Let's look at the memory consumption components of a typical data parallel task. There are four major components. Local data structure, process the input, and process input, and output. We will release the local data structures, and also um, the process input will be released. We will try to keep the unprocessed portion of the input in the memory, because later, we will use it and process it. But if it is necessary, we can also serialize it to the disk to release the memory. There are two kinds of output. If the output can be directly um, pushed to the next stage, then we call it a final result. So we will just push out the final result to the next stage and release the memory. Otherwise, we call it intermediate result because we need another aggregation before we push it out. We can also serialize the intermediate results to the disk to release the memory. So after the interrupts and releasing memory, we have more memory for the remaining tasks. So they can continue execution without any memory pressure. If our uh, system detects we have enough memory for another task instance, then the system can increase the parallelism degree by creating a new task instance, so we can get better performance. In the previous slides, I talked about the main idea of our technique, but uh, to efficiently uh, interrupt a task and uh, uh, develop a system which enable our technique is uh, not trivial stuff. We need to overcome two major challenges. First, we need to expose the semantics, because to efficiently interrupt the task and resume the task, 
the system needs some semantic. For example, the system needs to know what kind of uh, uh, partial results can be directly pushed to the next stage, and what kind of results should be stay in the memory to be processed. The second challenge is how to interrupt and reactive task during the execution efficiently. So our approach um, is a combination of pro program model and a runtime system. It requires minimal user effort. So using our program model, um, you, um, developers can easily expose the semantics to the system. The user effort is minimal. It's very easy uh, to write I task using our program model. And our runtime system can automatically conduct the operations during the execution. In this talk, I will focus on the program model and uh, briefly talk about the runtime system. Full details can be found in the paper. Let's first look at the program model. What do we need in this program model? First, we need a unified representation of input and output. Why do we need it? Because we hope our system is general enough to be applied on different frameworks. So uh, different systems have different kind of input and output type. They should all, uh, all provide such following two semantics. First, um, we need to, uh, the system need to know how to separate process and process the portion of the input. So when a task inter is interrupted, the system can release the process portion of the input and keep the unprocessed input in the memory. And the system need, also need to know how to serialize and deserialize the data. So when we have memory pressure, we can serialize and de, uh, the data into the disk. And the later when we need it, we can deserialize it from the disk. Also in our program model, we need a, we need a definition of an interruptible task. This definition can guarantee that we always interrupt the task safely. And this task, uh, this definition um, tells the system what kind of actions it should take when interrupt happens. Also, the system needs to know how to handle the partial results um, generated because of um, interrupts. Let's first look at our unified way to represent input and output. So in our program model, we represent input and output as data partitions, uh, which is a predefined um, class in our program model. So um, this uh, data, uh, data partition abstract class needs to provide two kinds of uh, semantic. One is tell the system how to separate processed and unprocessed portion of the input. And second, it need to tell the system how to serialize and deserialize the data. To achieve the first goal, we define a field called cursor. This cursor points to the first unprocessed tuple in the data partition. And to achieve the second goal, <laughs> user need to implement two methods called serialize and deserialize. These two methods will be automatically caught by the system when it is needed. Let's look at how to use our program model to define an interruptible task. So it's very easy. So the user just make their existing task extend our iTask. Here is the iTask abstract class. It needs to provide two kinds of semantics. So first, it tells the system what kind of actions the system should take when interrupt happens. And second, you need to guarantee that we always interrupt at the safe place. User will define the method inter interrupt and specify what kind of actions the system need to take. For example, how to deal with the partial results. And second, <coughs> uh, there is a method called scale loop defined in this uh, um, class. So this scale loop will iterate all the data tuples in the data partition. Um, in the mostly existing work, they already provide this kind of logic. We just make it explained here. 
So we can easily insert the memory check um, to make sure we don't have the memory pressure before we're processing the data. If we have memory pressure, we can simply uh, break the scale loop and interrupt the task. Otherwise, we just uh, process this data tuple. Another question is how to handle the partial results generated by the interrupt. Some kind of uh, partial results can be directly pushed out to the next stage, but some we need to merge them. We need to aggregate the data from different uh, partial results. So using a normal task, I task cannot solve the problem because the scale loop only take one data partition. To solve this problem, we propose MI task. Most, of, uh, most parts of this MI task are the same as I task. The only difference is that MI task, um, the scale loop takes a partition iterator. So that means we take uh, multiple data partitions as input. In the scale loop, it will iterate all the data partitions, aggregate the uh, data. Also, we will check the memory pressure before we processing each data tuple. Here is an example uh, using our program model to implement a word count uh, program on Hyrax framework. Hyrax uh, is a high performance data parallel system. In Hyrax, we define a task as operator. And uh, Operator is a node in the data flow graph. Different operators can be connected by the channel, which is the edge in the graph node, uh, in the data graph. So the original version without our iTask technique, there are only two mapper operator, uh, two operators, up map operator and the reduce operator. The map operator will take a chunk of input from distributed, distributed file system and iterate all the words and update the corresponding uh, count. When the job is done, it will output the results to the shuffling algorithm. The reduce operator will take the input from shuffling algorithm and aggregate the counts for the words in the same hash bucket. And when the job is finished, it will output the final result to the distributed file system. So with our I task, there are three different operators. Map operator, reduce operator, and merge operator. Map operator is a normal I task. When the uh, memory pressure occurs and the task is interrupted, then we will just push out the, the partial result to the shuffling algorithm because this can be directly used by the reduce operator. And the reduce operator <laughs> will take the input from the shuffling algorithm. And if there is no memory pressure, no interrupt, it can directly write the result to the um, distributed file system. If the reduce operator is interrupted, uh, the partial result is intermediate result. That means we need to aggregate before we output it. So we have a merge operator after the reduce operator. When the reduce operator um, outputs a partial result, it will tag mm, the fragments with uh, mm, hash bucket ID. So later, all the fragments with the same hash bucket ID will be aggregated by the merge operator. The merge operator is a, a MI task. So um, it takes different data partitions as input and it is also interruptible. When it is interrupted, it will uh, output further fragments and tag it with the same hash bucket ID. And later, another merge operator will take it and merge them. In the previous slides, I have talked about how to use our program model to expose the semantics. Now, I will uh, introduce our runtime system. There are three components in our uh, runtime system. Monitor, scheduler, and partition manager. Monitor will keep checking the memory condition. If it finds we have enough memory for another task instance, it will send scroll signal to the scheduler. 
if it, it detects memory pressure, then it will send a reduced signal to both a partition manager and scheduler. Partition manager is in charge of our data partitions. It can transfer the content of a data partition between memory and disk. This is transparent to the users. The scheduler can interrupt a task upon the memory pressure. It can also in, uh, create a new task instance if we have enough resource. We have implemented our system on two different frameworks. So this demonstrates that our framework is general enough to be applied on different systems. All of our experiments are done on an 11 node Amazon EC2 cluster. The first set of experiments are done on Hadoop framework. The goal is to show the effectiveness of our iTask system on real world problems. There are five benchmarks. All, all, all five benchmarks are collected from the Stack Overflow and they are all real world problem, uh, pro programs. There are three versions for each program, original, rfix, and itask. We apply the fix recommended on the website to get rfix version. And we apply our itask technique on the original programs to get our itask version. Here, this table, from the second column, we can see that all of the original um, programs suffer from memory pressure and crash because of out of memory error. Although both RFIX and ITASK can help the program survive memory pressure, ITASK can uh, provide better performance. So on average, ITASK versions are about 62% faster than the solutions recommended on the website. The second side of experiments are done on Hyrax uh, frameworks. The goal is to show how our technique helps the programs uh, um, under memory pressure and improve their performance and scalability. There are also five programs. All five programs are hand-optimized applications collected from a Hyrax code repository. And there are two versions, original and iTask. To have a fair comparison, we iterate all the configurations, and later we pick two for the original versions. One configuration is for the best performance, and one is for the best scalability. Here, this figure shows the improvements of our iTask on performance. In this figure, the X axis is the benchmark name, and Y axis is a normalized speed up. Higher is better. On average, iTask um, is about 34% faster than the original version. So the reason why we are fast is because first, we reduce the um, uh, GC effort. Second, we can dynamically change the parallelism degree to achieve better performance. This figure shows the improvements on the scalability of our iTask system. The x-axis is a benchmark name, and the y-axis is a normalized um, scalability. We define the scalability as the largest data set size. Higher is better in this figure. On average, iTask can scale to about six times larger data set. But actually, I think uh, our iTask technique can scale to larger data set because uh, in some experiments, we do not have a larger input. We already use the largest uh, input. To conclude, our approach is a program model and a runtime system. It's very easy to use and very easy to apply on the existing frameworks. And our iTask system is a first a semantic, a systematic approach to help a data parallel system a task survive memory pressure. Um, and our iTask can also provide better performance and scalability compared to the solutions recommended on the website. Thanks very much for the attention, and I'm, I'm happy to take questions. Hi. <clears throat>
Cheng Tang from NYU. So uh, this is very interesting work, but uh, what if it, when GVM is out of memory, but instead of crash, we somehow do very naive paging? So uh, I'm wondering if that's a better solution compared with your work. Uh, so do we use uh, some a virtual me a memory technique? Yeah, uh, let's say like this, uh, when one task is out of memory, so the GVM itself would just uh, you know, write that task to disk. And yeah, that's so all. our technique does not need to um, save a lot of uh, data to the, uh, to the disk and mm -hmm. when the task is interrupted. We just need to re require um, uh, which portion of the input is processed and which portion is not. So we just uh, save a little bit uh, states of the program and if you use, just use a naive paging, then that will cost a lot of uh, I.O. and it's very ex expensive. Also, um, uh, we can expose more exp uh, semantics to the system. So they can smartly decide which part should be swapped to the disk. And uh, we just uh, try to minimize the I.O. cost. I think uh, our solution is much better than just naively using big, uh, paging and we can provide much better uh, performance. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Malte Schwarzkopf, Cambridge and MIT. So as I understand your solution, you reduce parallelism in order, to, uh, in order to reduce memory pressure. However, in some situations, you might actually want to increase parallelism because memory pressure is localized to a single machine, right? So you could do, instead of suspending and resuming your task, you could split it into two tasks and put half of your work on, on a different machine. Is that, would that be a viable approach? And if so, have you considered doing that? Uh, so our goal is to solve the single machine uh, pressure. And uh, the, the work you mentioned is done by the global cluster-wide uh, resource manager like uh, Yarn. So we only target on single machines. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kurt Collison, VMware. Um, a similar question to that last one. It seems like you're introducing stragglers uh, in, in your technique, uh, and so it, it would appear to me that uh, it's uh, the root cause of this kind of memory pressure problem would be more to, due to uh, misconfiguration and missizing of workloads. Uh, so I understand your your problem definition of of addressing the single machine memory problem, but it seems like in the bigger picture, the, the root cause is really more due to lack of, of sufficient resources to s satisfy the workload. Um, sorry, uh, so your question is? So the question is, aren't you introducing stragglers in your technique? Uh, introduce what? Stragglers, Stragglers. right? So. With data parallel, you're, you're trying to avoid having stragglers, but it seems to me in your technique, you're actually introducing stragglers. Um, uh, well, our technique is to dynamic change in the parallelism degree. So is that your yeah. question? I understand that. Let's yeah. take it offline. So, okay, okay, thank you. <laughs>